Hello Flight Simmers and welcome back to Alpha Hotel Flight Simulator Training. This is Lesson 17 in our VFR or Private Pilot Training Series. In this video we'll focus on the unique challenges that flying at night presents us and techniques we can use to manage those unique risks. We'll talk about some of the things you should think about before undertaking a flight at night, look at the lighting available on the Cessna 152, and take a look at a short cross-country trip at night to see how it differs from a day cross-country. In the real world, you need to get some flight training at night in order to get your private pilot certificates. The regs specify that you get at least three hours of night flight training with your instructor, including 10 takeoffs and landings at night to a full stop, and this should involve flight in the traffic pattern, and one cross-country flight of over 100 nautical miles total distance at night. With most students, this means that you'll spend one night training flight in the pattern with your instructor getting most of your night landings, and one training flight with your instructor doing a night cross country that is an out and back to an airport that's at least 50 nautical miles away. You'll notice that there is no requirement for solo night time, and actually students are not authorized to fly at night without specific authorization from their instructor. Obviously, the biggest difference between day and night flying is that it will be more difficult to see things at night, but how much more difficult and what you can and can't see depends on a number of different factors. The phase and position of the moon are probably the biggest factors in how dark the environment is, particularly in Flight Simulator. The moon phases and when it rises and sets are accurately replicated in Flight Simulator, it can make a big difference on how well you can see. Flying at night with a full moon does provide significantly more light in the real world, although many people say this is overdone in flight sim, and I'd be hard-pressed to disagree with them. In the real world, flying at night with a full moon over a snow-covered landscape is almost as light as flying during the day. But when flying on a night with no moon, it can be difficult to even di distinguish the horizon. If you want to find information on what phase the moon will be in on a particular date, it's pretty easy to search for a lunar calendar online. When the moon rises is at its peak and sets are correlated with its phase. For example, a full moon always rises around sunset, peaks about midnight, and sets near sunrise. And it's easy to find this information online as well. Also remember that if you have cloud cover between the moon and yourself, the illumination it provides will be diminished or eliminated. The season you're flying during also determines when it will get dark and how dark it will get. If you're flying during the winter months, daylight is much shorter than in the summer, and, at least in flight sim, it gets more completely dark at night. This effect is amplified the closer you get to the poles. For example, there is very little daylight in northern Alaska in the wintertime. and the sun doesn't really set in the summer, and this is accurately modeled in flight sim. If you're flying on one of those completely dark nights, what you can and can't see on the ground is determined by whether it's illuminated or not. Some of the things we're used to navigating by during the day, like water features, railroads, and power lines, become invisible on a dark night. Roads that are illuminated can be seen, but only major roads like interstates and major highways are typically lighted, and many of those are only lit in urban areas. In the real world, you might be able to spot an unlit road by seeing traffic on it, but in flight sim, only the road traffic that's in fairly close proximity to the aircraft is depicted. One thing that's easy to see at night is cities. All the lights from street lights, lighted signs, and lighted buildings make them easy to see at night. In fact, the yellow shaded area on sectional charts depicts what a city's light pattern looks like at night. Another thing that Flight Simulator accurately depicts is how you can see a city's lights giving off a slight glow over the horizon before you can actually see the city itself on clear nights. This phenomenon is something you'll see in the real world as well. Most, though not all, paved airports are lit at night with runway lighting, often taxiway lighting, and sometimes approach lighting. The runway lights can sometimes be difficult to see when looking at the airport from the side due to the space between the lights, but it's usually easier to see when looking down the runway. In the real world, airport lighting can often be pilot controlled at untowered fields, meaning the airport lights are off unless the pilot turns them on by clicking the mic on the radio, and then they can, they can then control how bright they are as well. 
but in flight sim, all the lights are on all the time and there's only one brightness setting. Most airports have a rotating beacon to help pilots find the field at night. For civilian land airports, these beacons always rotate between green and white. If you want more details about the types of lighting that can be found at an airport, make sure to check out my ground school video about the airport environment, where I go into detail about all the different lighting systems you can find at an airport. I'll leave a link to that video in the video description. On a dark night in sparsely populated areas or over water, particularly in lower visibility, it can be difficult to even see any ground features or the horizon, so it's a good idea to get some proficiency at flying on instruments if you want to do much night flying. Many student pilots or new private pilots are surprised how quickly any sort of outside visual reference disappears when they take off on a dark night, particularly if they're taking off in a rural area and pointed towards an area during their initial climb out that has little illumination. Another thing that's difficult to see at night is mountainous terrain, particularly since there doesn't tend to be a lot of lighting in mountainous areas. Flying in mountainous areas at night is not a good idea unless you're familiar with the area, know the departure and arrival procedures you should use to avoid terrain if you can't see it, and can climb high enough en route to ensure terrain clearance. Synthetic vision on avionics like the G1000 is very helpful in avoiding terrain you can't see, but it shouldn't be used as the primary means of terrain avoidance. Clouds can also be difficult to see at night. You can usually see lower clouds being illuminated by city lights if they form near cities, but in areas where there's not much ground lighting, it can be easy to fly into them with little warning. Fair weather cumulus clouds that form on warm summer days typically dissipate at night. To avoid other types of clouds above and in front of you at night, keep an eye on the stars. If you're flying or climbing towards an area that doesn't seem to have any stars, you're likely headed towards a cloud and should alter course. This technique doesn't guarantee you won't hit a cloud though, so again, it's wise to have some practice at flying on instruments when flying at night and always have a plan as to what you're going to do if you inadvertently enter a cloud. In the real world, it's also always prudent to get a thorough weather briefing before a night flight so you have a reasonable assurance that you'll be able to complete the flight as planned without having to worry about inadvertent instrument flight. Because many of the features we rely on for VFR navigation tend to be harder to see at night, even VFR pilots tend to rely more on electronic forms of navigation when flying in the dark. If you're not familiar with or proficient at navigating using GPS, VORs, or NDBs, it's a good idea to take a look at these topics if you want to do much flying at night. And I just happen to know a guy who made some videos about those subjects. Links are in the video description. This isn't to say that you can't use VFR navigation techniques at night, you just have to adapt the techniques for the level of light that you'll have. For example, if you want to fly using pilotage on a dark night, make sure there's a well-lit major road that you can follow. You can also use dead bracketing, but you'll want to make sure that your checkpoints are well-lit objects that you can see at night, such as cities, airports, and major highways. So let's take a look at some of the features on the 152 and in flight sim in general that we use when flying at night. Okay, so looking at the lighting controls for the Cessna 152, uh, they're all located in one place. They are all on this uh, row of white switches down here, just below the instru engine instrument gauges. Uh, as far as cabin lighting goes and panel lighting goes, it's very simple and very straightforward on this uh, on the 172. It's this light that says dome light. That's the only uh, cabin lighting or instrument lighting that you have. You flip that on. It turns this red monstrosity on, and the only good thing you can say about it is it does light up the entire panel, and you can see the entire panel. It is a little glary, and not the prettiest thing we've ever seen, but it does get the job done. Uh, this light is actually located over your head up here, and it shines down on the instrument panel. Uh, the red color is because that uh, red light is the only uh, kind of light that doesn't uh, trigger... Uh, the cells that you use in your eyes, uh, they're called rods, uh, at night, so it does not affect your night vision uh, when you turn a red light on. That's the reason that uh, like fighter pilots and such will uh, have briefing rooms and uh, you know lounges that have red lights because it won't affect their night vision. And they'll be well dark adapted if they stay in red light. 
so that's what that switch does. Uh, it turns on that light, and that is the instrument lighting. That's the only instrument lighting that you have in the 152. When you get to other airplanes, they have much nicer backlit instruments, but for our training airplane, uh, that is all that you have. And you will notice that if you turn that light off uh, when it is completely dark outside in Flight Simulator, it is indeed difficult to see anything, including the switch to turn it back on. Uh, one kind of neat thing that they do have in Flight Simulator, if you push the Alt L key, left Alt and L key, it will give you a little uh, flashlight type headlamp. Uh, this is a very directional light uh, and it moves as you move the camera around, so anything you shine the camera on, uh, including things outside the aircraft like the wings and the wing spar, you can shine it in the baggage compartment, you can shine it on the tail, and it will illuminate all of those things. Uh, so kind of a little cool little thing. Uh, you may prefer this, flying with this, to flying with the, the red light. The only problem is that it's, again, very directional. Uh, so, you know, if you've got it on your instrument, engine instrument, or your uh, flight instruments, it's hard to see something like the tachometer. Uh, but it is a little less harsh a light than is the uh, panel lighting. Uh, so that's all the exterior, the interior lighting that we have on the 152. I'll go ahead and flip that uh, panel light back on for us. As far as the exterior lighting, the first thing we'll look at is the nav lights. We'll go and flip those on. And this uh, turns on and off uh, the green light in the right wing, the red light in the left wing, and then a white light on the tail. And nav lights are required for aircraft that are uh, flying at night. Uh, if your aircraft is not equipped with them, it's not legal to take up at night. And you're required to have them on per the FARs from uh, sunset until sunrise. Uh, most operators, particularly commercial operators, operate them all the time. They have them on anytime the aircraft is powered, but legally you only have to have them on uh, from sunset until sunrise. Uh, in addition to providing some visibility for other aircraft to be able to see you, uh, they also give you an, give them an indication of uh, where you are, what your orientation is related to them. They know if they're looking at a green light that they're looking at your right wing. If they're looking at a red light, they're looking at your left wing. So they can kind of tell which way you are oriented relative to them just by looking at those lights. So the next exterior light is the strobe lights. Turn those on and we have one on each wing. This provides a bright strobe light that uh, flashes about once every second on each wing and increases your visibility to other aircraft. Uh, there's no legal requirement as to when you have to operate these. Good operating practice is to not use them on the ground, uh, at least not until you're taking off, as they are quite bright and in the real world they can uh, cause deterioration of night vision for other pilots. Uh, so generally you want to turn them on before takeoff and then common operating procedures to keep them on while you're in flight and then turn them off after you land. Uh, it's also a good idea if you find yourself going into a cloud into instrument conditions, at least in the real world, you probably want to turn them off uh, because that can cause uh, a flash on the cloud that will be blinding to you. The next light over is the beacon or the anti-collision light as it's sometimes called. Uh, so we'll flip that on and that is the red flashing light that is on the top of the tail. Some aircraft have these on the top of their fuselage. Some airliners actually have them on the top and bottom of their fuselage. They actually have two. And uh, as far as the legal requirement, I believe these are required to be operated at night, but most operators use this as basically a notifica notification to other pilots that the aircraft is powered and the engines are about to start. So generally you're going to operate this light uh, even during the day um, from the time right before you start the engine until the engine is shut down uh, is the common operating practice on that. And these are required. You either have to have a red uh, beacon, flashing beacon, or uh, white strobe lights. You have to have one or the other in order to operate your aircraft at night. And then the final lights that we have here are the taxi and the landing lights. The taxi light is the switch on the left, and you'll notice when you turn that on, both of these are located in the nose. The taxi light seems to provide a little bit of a wider beam. The, the width of the beam is a little bit wider 
uh, then if you turn the landing light on, that seems to be a little more focused and seems to be a little dimmer. I have to think that these may be wired up a little bit backwards in Flight Simulator. Uh, it seems like the, the brighter, wider light should probably be the landing light, uh, but um, I'm, so I'm thinking those are probably backwards in, in Flight Sim. Uh, but those are uh, those are the controls for those, and generally the operating practice is generally you want the taxi light on anytime uh, you're moving on the ground, uh, just being cognizant of other airplanes and making sure you're not shining the light in their face so they don't lose their night vision. And uh, then, of course, the landing light you want uh, anytime you're taking off or landing. You can also turn it on uh, anytime you're operating near other aircraft to increase your visibility. And generally, once you get above about a thousand feet, you're usually going to turn those off and then turn them back on once you get back into the traffic pattern at the airport that you are uh, going to land at. Uh, technically, there is no legal requirement to operate these. Uh, if you have an airplane that you're operating for hire, it's required to have a landing light, although there's not a rule that you actually have to use it. It does have to be installed on the airplane. So that is all the wonderful uh, lighting equipment for night flight that we have on the Cessna 152. So the demo cross country that we're going to do for our little night cross country here is going to be between uh, Conway Regional Airport. The uh, identifier here is kind of obscured by the course line, but it is CXW. And we will head up to the northwest, uh, up to Clarksville Municipal, which uh, the identifier on that one is Hotel 35. Uh, this will be kind of a combination uh, dead reckoning and piloted trip. Uh, we'll go ahead and take off from Conway and take up our heading of 302 to head up towards uh, Clarksville. Uh, but we also have the Interstate I-40 that we can follow as well. Uh, this area is just to the north of Little Rock, or northwest of Little Rock, Arkansas. So that's the area of the country we're in. You'll also notice that during the day, we could also follow the Arkansas River all the way up to Clarksville, but you'll see at night uh, that we won't be able to see that really at all. Uh, so that'll be a good contrast between a day and night. We'll take off from Conway, and you notice that Conway is about four miles to the southeast, or excuse me, southwest of the city that it serves. So it's kind of out in a rural area with not a lot of lighting. And so we'll see how dark it can be when you take off from that kind of a setting. And then our uh, then we'll take up our heading of 302, uh, fly up towards Clarksville, and our dead reckoning checkpoints are going to be our big bright cities of Moralton and Russellville. All right, so to set up for this uh, night cross country, we'll work left to right, just like we always do. So we're gonna use the aircraft selection. We'll do the Cessna 152, just the regular old 152, weight and balance. Uh, I like to do full gas, tanks of gas in the 152 at night. So we'll do two full tanks of gas there. More fuel at night is better. And the two 170-pound passengers is fine. That's about all we need to do with the airplane. Uh, our departure airport is going to be KCXW, Kilo Charlie X-Ray Whiskey, which is Cantrell Field in Conway, Arkansas. And runway 22 for departure is just fine. If you want to start on the ramp, that's fine as well, but we'll start on the runway. And then if you want to put in the arrival airport, uh, just to have it in your VFR flight planner, uh, we're going to use Hotel 35 which is Clarksville Municipal Airport in uh, Clarksville, Arkansas. Again, a distance of, it says 53 nautical miles. It was just over 50 nautical miles when I looked at it in uh, Sky Vector. And then as far as date and time, we're gonna go with January uh, the, excuse me, second. And the reason we're doing that is that is the date of the new moon that is closest to the winter solstice. So closest to the longest night of the year. So we should have a nice dark night for flying. And then we'll set up the time down here in the bottom left and we'll pick a 10 o'clock time for the departure. And that should give us a nice dark night uh, to do our night cross country on. We'll set up a few more things with the weather once we get uh, spawned into the session and we are ready to go flying. All right, so we're sitting on the uh, end of runway 22 in Conway, and we will do just a few last minute changes to the weather here. We've got the time and the date set, oh, but moved it over to January the 3rd. So we'll move it back to January the 2nd. Uh, we will get rid of the wind, so we have a nice calm wind night. And since it is the middle of January, we'll back off the temperature. We'll make it like uh, 40 degrees, I guess. Uh, should be fairly realistic for January in Arkansas. They get uh, nights that are not super cold out there sometimes. 
And uh, that is it as far as the setup. We've got our before takeoff checklist complete. We've got our um, lights all set up for a night departure and we are ready to go flying. To conduct this flight, perform a normal takeoff from runway 22 at Conway. At 500 feet AGL, or about 800 feet MSL, you can make your right turn on course to a heading of 302. Climb on course to your cruise altitude of 4,500. At 4,500, perform a normal level off and then conduct your cruise procedures and checklists. As we level off at uh, 4,500 feet after we've done our cruise uh, checklist and cruise procedures, we'll notice that off here to the right side of the nose uh, looks to be our first city, our first checkpoint. I'm drifting off my heading here a little bit, so I'll correct back over there to about a 302 heading. And then we'll take a look at Moralton. So you can see it's pretty easy to see cities at night. We'll take a look over there, and there's Moralton. Oops, I still have my flashlight on. Uh, so they're pretty easy to see and identify at night, and then you can see that uh, I-40 is heading off there to the west. And another nice thing about uh, cities as checkpoints is they're pretty easy to see from far away on a nice clear night. It looks like that's uh, Russellville up there already. Uh, and we're supposed to go just to the south of Moralton, just a little bit to the north of Russellville. Looks like we're on track to do that. Uh, so our first checkpoint's working out. Looks like things are going good. So we'll just hold this heading and continue up to the uh, northwest. And as we're making our way to Russellville here, let's uh, step outside the airplane for just a second. Let's uh, take the camera outside here and we'll play around with the settings of the moon here a little bit. You can kind of see what a difference the moon makes. So uh, right now we've still got our date set for January 2nd. I'm going to click this over towards the 17th, which is the full moon, and watch as I do this. What comes out as far as what we can see? So there is 17th. That's a full moon. And look at the difference in Flight Simulator that that makes. You can see the river now that you couldn't see before. You can see the ground now. You can see the fields even. And again, a lot of people say this is uh, way overdone in Flight Simulator, and I can't say that I disagree with that. But uh, you do see a difference in the real world in uh, when you have a moon versus when you don't, particularly a full moon, it, it does illuminate quite a bit. Uh, not quite to this degree, but uh, this also gives you a good demonstration of what you're not seeing when you're flying on a dark night. Uh, you can't see the fields, you can't see the water really at all. You know, pretty much the only thing you can see at night when you don't have a moon is uh, things that are lit up. So that gives a good demonstration of uh, kind of what the difference is between day and night and what the difference in flight sim is between uh, when you have a full moon and when you have uh, a new moon or no. And as we get a little farther along on the route here, we can see that uh, we're starting to pick up Russellville pretty good. Again, you can pick it up from a good, pretty good ways out. I'm going to start to look for the airport, which is on the east side of town. So I should start to see the airport beacon over here somewhere. I can even see the little town of uh, Atkins, just south of the interstate there. And then we can see that the interstate runs up and to the north of Russellville and then runs on that direction and uh, so Clarksville should uh, start to come into sight just shortly after we are over Russellville. Uh, so everything looks to be going good here and we'll just continue on this heading. So we're getting a little closer to Russellville here. In fact I can start to see the uh, taxiway lights uh, illuminated since we're approaching the airport from the side. Flight Sim is particularly bad about not letting you see the uh, runway lights until you're kind of oriented with the uh, down the runway but I can't see the uh, taxiway lights there and so it looks like we're on course. Another topic I want to bring up is visual illusions because they are kind of common at night. One of the most common uh, visual illusions you have is what they call false horizon and that's where you pick up something like this uh, line of uh, lights here, this road here, and you think that's the horizon so you think you're tilted a little bit there when actually we are quite level right now if we looked at our attitude indicator. Uh, so just be aware that that can happen and uh, make sure that you reference your attitude indicator when you're flying at night. Uh, if you pick up something like a road, sometimes you can your brain can kind of just lock onto that and say that's the horizon and make you think you're in a turn when you're not. Uh, so it's always good, again, to look at those instruments when you're doing night flying. Also still not picking up the beacon here at Russellville. Maybe we'll be able to see that as we come by, but right now we're not seeing that either. 
another technique that's helpful at night, particularly in the 152, is to kind of move the camera forward away from the uh, bright, harsh red light, and you can see a little more out the window. In fact, you can see the city lights are lighting up uh, Lake Dardanelle out here, part of the Arkansas River there. And sometimes you can get a little clearer view if you do that. You can also try turning off the um, interior light, the cabin light, too, if you don't mind not being able to see the instruments for a few seconds. And you can find the button to turn it back on again. Uh, as we get a little closer to the airport there, you can see that we are starting to pick up the uh, runway lights. Still not seeing a beacon, so maybe that's just not uh, established in Flight Simulator. But uh, it does look like we are, we're supposed to go just north of the city. Looks like we're doing that, so it looks like we're on course. And in fact, it looks like I am starting to pick up, looks like even perhaps the beacon and the, uh, maybe the runway lights for Huntsville, or excuse me, uh, Clarksville up there. You can see that the interstate still bends around up to the northwest there, so if we continue to follow that, we should be on course. Uh, so it looks like we are on track and should be landing here in Huntsville just shortly. And another thing to look at, at uh, in Flight Simulator is night is looking down at the roads. You'll notice that that nice busy interstate, it's really well lit, but there is no traffic on it. And Flight Simulator will depict traffic that uh, you can see if you look uh, right down just behind the tail of the airplane right here. You see some traffic on that portion of the interstate, but if you look anywhere else on the roads out there, there is no traffic. So uh, in, in the real world, when you have a heavily traveled road, you will see red lights for tail lights going one direction and white lights for uh, headlights coming the other direction. But that's not something you're going to have as your visual reference in Flight Simulator. As we get past uh, Russellville there, I am definitely starting to pick up the lights of uh, Clarksville there. Uh, and the runway, or excuse me, the airport is to the uh, northeast of the city. And I'm starting to see, looks like maybe the Pappies and some runway lights over there. Uh, so it looks like that's Clarksville. Looks like we're just about getting there. Should be starting down here in just a couple minutes. Uh, and then uh, I'll probably maneuver up to the north to make a nice straight in uh, visual into runway 27 there at Clarksville. All right, so I'm getting a, I'm getting a good visual on uh, Clarksville Airport right now. Uh, so I'm going to go ahead and maneuver up to the north just a little bit. I don't want to go too far north because there is terrain up there. Uh, I'm going to maneuver for the visual straight into runway 27, and I am going to start my descent for the airport now. And uh, we should be on the ground here in just a few minutes. And so we look to be about uh, about seven miles out now. And again, I'm maneuvering up to the north just a little bit. I've got a good uh, visual on the runways. Looks like we've got threshold hot lights right there, runway lights, taxiway lights. Looks like we've got the uh, Pappy or Vassie. It's supposed to have a Pappy on the uh, left-hand side of the runway. Uh, so we'll just move over into position for a visual approach to runway uh, 27. And we'll make our night landing there and finish out our nice night cross country. Uh, one thing to be aware of is that at night, uh, particularly if you're landing in uh, or making a descent over a terrain that doesn't have a lot of lights, you may experience the illusion that you're higher than you uh, actually are. Uh, so just be aware of that and uh, just use, if the airport has one, the runway has one, make sure and use that Pappy or Vazzy uh, to keep yourself on the proper glide slope and then you won't be sucked in by any visual illusions. As you make your approach and landing, don't forget to accomplish your before landing checklist to make sure you have your landing lights turned on. They don't do much in the 152, but they should provide a little illumination of the runway markings. Flying at night provides some additional challenges, but night is one of the most beautiful times to be in the air, and Flight Simulator 2020 renders a night environment better than any simulator that's come before it. That concludes this lesson. Hopefully it's equipped you with the skills you need to fly confidently when the skies are dark. As always, if you've enjoyed the content, please don't forget to like, subscribe, and ring the notification bell. Thanks for watching, and we'll see you next time.